do take on um, kind of uh, an outlier of a section today, or at least it feels that way to me. I mean, there were a bunch of functions we could look at. I mean, we could review, um, you know, quadratics or exponentials or whatever. The only type of function the author of the textbook seems to think we ought to be doing now, though, is um, linear functions, which I guess for elementary A makes sense. Um, they're sort of the the type of function we first introduce. So let's either learn or remind ourselves what a linear function is. I mean, we'll put an put like some math stuff on the board. But before we do that, linear functions are functions with constant rates of change. And you identify a rate of change by its unit. Something per something. So I mean sort of Examples we always give a or n our the worker makes seventeen dollars per hour. So Seventeen dollars per hour. So, in terms of what I have written up here about rates of change, the workers' funds total amount of money the worker has made. Let's say funds are changing and they're changing in a very predictable way. For every 17 hours the worker works, their um, savings account gets an additional $17. Or, you know, you drive down the highway at 65 miles per hour. Miles per hour. If we let Y be the distance you have driven, Well, Y is changing, and it's changing in this very regulated way. For every hour that passes, Y changes by 65. Y increases by 65. 
Um, and I mean, these are kind of the classic examples. Linear equations do show up in nature, in, you know, biology and stuff. But the sort of most clear cut examples always seem to be the human manufactured ones for this type of function. So a linear equation. between variables y and x is this famous uh, relationship y equals mx plus b. where M and B are constants. Um, and M can be positive, M can be negative, B could be positive, B could be negative. And we'll talk about these constants in turn. What are these constants doing? Well, a linear function has a constant rate of change. And that rate of change is just sitting right there in the equation. It's m. So here, if y is the distance we have traveled and this constant rate of change is 65, m equals 65. Here, if we're just looking at funds going into the account and not looking at expenses, then that's increasing at a rate of $17 per hour. M equals 17. Now, in both of those examples, M was positive, but I said on the previous frame that M can be positive or negative. So, um, M is positive when Y is increasing. M is negative. when y is decreasing. So let's try to think of an example because we've seen two examples where m is positive, where y is increasing. Let's see if we can take an example and tweak it just a little to have a negative m. Let's say an example we've looked at before and similar to the driving example we just did. So let's say you're driving home and sixty-five miles per hour. In the previous example, we let y be the distance we have driven. Um, that's 
probably not not what you're really interested in on, on a long trip, though. What you're probably more interested in is how far you still have to go. Like if you call your parents and they ask you where you are, you're not going to say, well, I've driven 200 miles. You're going to say, well, I'm 100 miles from your house. So it would probably sort of make more sense here for why to be your distance from your destination. And as time passes, your distance from your destination is decreasing. The distance between my hands here, it's shrinking. So because this distance is now decreasing, M will be negative, negative 65. So this is what a linear relationship and sort of this M is in what I would think of as real world context. Um, something that we're often interested in and something that the textbook is very interested in, in this section, is looking at graphs. So, probably, or maybe we already know this, what's the, um, what's the graph of a linear relationship look like? <laughs> It's a straight line. It's a straight line. Thank you. So let's keep looking at M. But let's look at M briefly. We'll come back to this from a graphical sort of context. M or rather y equals 2x plus 3. Yeah. I haven't talked at all about what this b is doing. I'm just going to leave it in all of the graphs I create. Uh, all of the graphs I create will have a plus 3 in them. So there's 2x plus 3 y equals 0 0.5x plus 3, y equals 0 0.01x plus 3. So if you look at, here's the graph where m is really close to 0. Here's the graph where M is 0.5, is bigger. Here's the graph where M is bigger still. You see that the bigger M gets, the steeper this line becomes. So I get we just go nuts and that y be 200x plus 3, we get a line that looks almost vertical. So, graphically, when we're talking about what a graph looks like, M is called the slope. And M is controlling the steepness of this line. M is also controlling the direction of the line in the more general sense. Mm. 
you know, if we go here, let's uh, remove some distraction. And we know that y be negative 2x plus 3. You see the line looks different. Um, it looks different in the sense that as you read the graph from left to right, instead of going up, we are now going down. And of course, it's no coincidence that these um, graphs with positive slopes are all increasing. And then to throw a graph with a negative slope on here and it's decreasing, rather we can recognize a pattern If M is positive, the graph increases. It goes from the lower left to the upper right. If M is negative, The graph decreases. It goes from the upper left to the lower right. And um, we'll talk about, you know, if you have a graph, how do you find M? If you have points, how do you find M? All of that good stuff. But we should probably take a look at B before then. So we talked about M, um, sort of algebraically or in word problems. M is the rate of change. Graphically, M is the slope. This B is called the Y intersect, which, since we haven't defined Y intersects in this class, might not be the most immediately useful thing, but a y-intersect is a very intuitive bit of naming. We have a line, and it intersects the y-axis. So where does it intersect the y-axis? At B. Um, or a little more formally, at the point zero comma B. So going back to these equations. Um, I, um, I gave these all three as their y-intercept, and, you know, all of these do hit this axis at exactly the same point, at exactly at three. If I Uncluttered this, and then I created a slider. We can see very clearly what changing B is doing to this graph. It's not affecting the slope at all, but it's moving it up and down. So here B is 6.6, .6, and if we think on this point, 
we see the y intersect is 6.6. And this would be if instead of a positive m, I had a negative m. That's not changing this. So here b is negative 4.3, and we click around, and we see that this does intersect the y-axis at negative 4.3. Um, B in word problems is usually going to have some kind of concrete meaning, although it's not always so easy to say in words exactly what this is. Um, but B is Y. When x equals zero. So let's look, let's go through and let's discuss, um, let's discuss B in a few of the situations we've put on the whiteboard already. So we have an hourly worker, and we'll define x to be the hour's work. And we'll define y to be the money made. And we'll keep with whatever we put on the board earlier. I think it was um, 17. Thank you. So what would a realistic B value be here? So no, this isn't a trick question. You get a job at the cafeteria, but you haven't done any work yet or turned in a time sheet yet. How much money have you earned? Zero. Zero. So in this situation, it makes sense. For B to be zero. And of course, adding zero doesn't do anything. So it would be most common to just write Y equals 17 X. So let's say. You're driving home for, I forget what we call it, Easter weekend, but we can't call it that. Um, fall, fall, spring, spring break. Driving home for spring break. And we'll keep X. It will be the number of hours driven. And Y can be um, our distance from home. And, you know, obviously it's a, a little unrealistic. You, 
you don't always drive at 65 miles per hour. You would slow down as when you are driving through towns, but let's just keep that. Y is negative 65. So what would B be in this context? I mean, not necessarily as a number, the number is going to vary from student to student, but what does B physically represent? Like your miles, or what do you mean, like your distance? It's a distance, I agree with that. Can you be a little more specific? Distance driven. Um, the distance driven is more or less going to come from this part of the graph. Like if you drive five miles, then if you drive for five hours, then you'll have driven 65 times five um, miles. So what do you have left to drive? What do you have left? So that's what that's getting at it. Remember though that this B isn't changing. This B is a constant. So when you've driven one mile, when you've driven on uh, one hour, when you've driven five hours, this B isn't changing. Is it total distance? Total? You know what I mean. I, I, I know what you mean. And you're, you're I think you're right. Um, again, or I shouldn't say again, but um, but let's try. Let's try just thinking in these terms. When I or you or whoever have driven, not at all. When I have driven zero hours, then why my distance from home is B. So B is the distance from home at the start of the trip. When you've driven zero my hours, so when you're still sitting in the car and putting the key in the ignition, B is how far you are from home. So, I mean, can someone give me a slightly less uh, Torturous way of saying that. It's like trip distance. Trip distance, that's good. I mean, something like assuming that you are starting your trip from Shadron. It's, it's the trip distance, exactly what you said. It's how far your starting point is from your ending point. It's how far Shadron is from your home. So, B, not so much in like, college algebra, but in maybe slightly more advanced classes, B would often be called something like an initial value. Because we think of some process at, as starting at x equals zero. At x equals zero, you start your job. 
at x equals zero, you start to drive home. And B is telling you, well, at the start, so initially, what's Y? Let's see if I can. Um, wow, it's a surprisingly non sound proof. Um, So something like a um a position K is forty five thousand dollars per year. But because this position is in such high demand, they'll offer you assigning a bonus. So in addition to your regular salary, you will be paid $7,000 to sign your name on the contract and take the job. Um, so there are two numbers here. There's a $45,000 and there's a $7,000. Um, this is a linear relationship, Y equals MX plus B, if X is the number of years worked and Y is your total revenue. So what's the relationship here? Y equals mx plus b, but y equals 45,000. And the reason that we know the 45,000 is the rate is, well, dollars per year always gets written, you know, a little differently, but it's something per something, dollars per year. So that's going to be the rate plus, and then sort of by process, of elimination, this 7,000 must be the B, but rather than think of it that way, let's try to reason it through. So remember that B is Y when X is zero. So B is the amount of money we may take in from this job before we've worked any year. Years. And in this particular situation, that B is 7,000. Uh, obviously a very different position from like the, the part-time hourly workers at Chadron's cafeteria who do not get paid sign up, sign up bonuses. So, something that we should probably do is finding the equations of lines through
So this is a um, that's very classroom example. It's not something I'm going to pretend to find super exciting, but if you're teach end up teaching any of the higher grades, it's something that you are going to need to be able to teach to your students. So we need to be able to do this. Um, so if you, if you heard the phrase ever, Euclidean mathematics or Euclidean geometry, Euclid was an ancient Greek, um, and he set down a list of axioms. Um, rules that he thought geometry should follow. And later people sort of started looking at his rules and saying, well, I don't agree with this one, or this rule doesn't work if you're looking at the surface of a sphere instead of a flat plane, and gave us non-Euclidean geometry. But one of the axioms of Euclidean geometry is that if you have two points on a plane, there is one and only one line that passes through those points. And the equation of a line is y equals mx plus b. Yeah. Um, maybe before I should go go any further, I'll just uh, the stuff we're about to do does break down. There is one type of line that is not y equals mx plus b. So just for our records, as it were, those are the vertical lines. A vertical line, instead of y being something, x is equal to something. But other than that, lines are y equals mx plus b. So if you have two points and you want to find the equation of a line that, that goes through those points, well, it's Speaking loosely, it's clear what we need. We need to find M and we need to find B. And if we can find M and B, then we found the equation of the line. So let's start with M. Um, is this, uh, I never know in this class if I'm doing review or not, does the phrase rise over the run? I'm seeing an odd, so this probably is review for most of you, but it's fine also if it isn't, then you haven't seen this before. If we want the slope of a line, and we have two points on a line, the slope is defined in terms of that vertical and that horizontal distance. And the vertical distance is the rise, and the horizontal distance, somewhat archaically, is called the run. And the slope is the rise 
over the rock. In terms of, you know, actually finding this, in terms of writing down an equation, I guess you could say, if this is the point, we'll call it x1 comma y1. And this is the point x2 comma y2. Then the rise comes from subtracting y coordinates. And the run comes from subtracting x coordinates. So we subtract the y coordinates. We subtract the x coordinates and we divide. So let's say, for example, we haven't talked about B yet. But let's say we have two points, just selecting them at random, one comma seven and negative three comma six. And we ask, well, what's the slope? What's the rate of change? So one of these has to be x1, y1. One of them has to be x2, y2. It doesn't matter in the least which point you select to be which. So that's just call the first point x1, y1. And the second point x2, y2. Then m equals six minus seven, y2 minus y1 divided by negative three minus one, x two minus x one. Um, six minus seven is negative one, negative three minus one is negative four. The negative signs cancel, we get one fourth. Now, expanding on something I said earlier, and by earlier, I mean just like a minute ago, I said that we need one of the points to be x1, y1, and we need one of the points to be x2, y2. And then I made the kind of interesting thing that it doesn't matter which is which. Let's say this is x2, y2. And this is x1, y1. Then when we find them, it will be y2, 7, minus y1, 6, over x1, 1, x2, sorry, 1, minus a negative 3. So be careful here. Minus a negative three is the same as addition, and you see that you wind up with one over four. And this is this sort of pattern is always going to be the case where 
you know, the only difference is in the size, but those things cancel and you always wind up with the same number, no matter which point you select for which rule. And we're very close to being done, but I feel like the last step always gives students just a bit more trouble than the first step. So rather than try to cram it into three minutes, we'll just pick up where we left off, where we're leaving off on Wednesday. Question. One really quick question. So when Y is zero, is it undefined? Or is it when M is zero? Or is your slope is zero? Um, so the only like, time you'd run into an undefined yeah, thing. I'm just reading that refresh my brain because it's positive, negative, and then is this zero slope? And then this is undefined or is it zero slope and then undefined? Zero. Zero slope. Undefined. Okay. Right, that's what I thought. And you can see that now. I mean, if you have like three comma seven and then three comma nine two points on a vertical line and you try to find um you wind up with a division by zero error thank you no I uh, here's my assignment. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds like all of you have assignments. Um, That's one of mine. I'll give the other one. All right. Today. Keep giving thought to math game night. What you want to do if you haven't been thinking about that.